do. Yep, it's laundry day. We're folding the laundry, talking about shitholes. You know, there are a lot of things we can be thankful for in the golden age. For one, we're learning more about how the government works than we've ever known before. We know about special counsels, and we know about recusing, and we know, we know about the Electoral College in a way we never knew before. Okay, most of us knew about most of that stuff. But I think the world is learning a lot in the age of Trump. Um, but in addition to that, there are, in, in every administration, <clears throat> there are words. They go from unspeakable to okay. Uh, we can thank the, the Bill Clinton administration for making blowjob a family word. Two words, I guess. And we can thank the Trump administration for finally, I've waited so long for this, bringing shithole the word to cable TV. Uh, not just bringing it, but <clears throat> seriously bringing it. Now, some of you saw that there's a, uh, there was a, a hoax, not a hoax, but a uh, false alarm warning in, in Hawaii that all the citizens got in their phones and said that there was a incoming missile attack. Incoming missile attack? Do you know where I'm going tomorrow? Guess where I'm going in a few hours? I'm going to that shithole Hawaii. Yes, the first vacation I've had. I don't know how long. Where does it have to be? Hawaii. I was pretty happy about this Hawaii vacation until almost an hour ago. But now, I'm thinking things are going to be a little more tense than they needed to be. Yeah, Haiti's looking good. We, I might I might pivot to Haiti. I hear good things. they got lots of doctors over there. And so, let me, let me get to the meat of this uh, laundry folding periscope here. And I am actually folding my laundry. Um, I've been telling you for a few years now about this two movies on one screen phenomenon. And I've been sort of narrating as we go, and you can see that the the folks who are anti-Trumpers are watching one movie, and the people who support him are watching an entirely different movie. Now, they, they each have a false idea of what the other one sees. You know, you can see your own movie, but you have to just sort of guess what the other ones are seeing, and we're, we're terrible at guessing. So, the... Uh, since we're terrible at guessing, and there are only a few times in the normal course of life that you'll have a situation where you can verify whether your movie is the, the one that's fitting the facts. Usually, um, you have all this confirmation bias and, you know, mixed in with real facts so that everybody watching their own movie can say, yeah, that fits my movie. Yeah, he, the president is acting exactly like I would expect him to act, you know, because of the movie I'm in. But now we're seeing, we're going to see, probably Monday, we're going to see a break, maybe tomorrow, we're going to see a break in the two movies. One of the movies is going to be falsified tomorrow. And we don't know which one. Tomorrow, maybe Monday. And here's how it's going to happen. So the anti-Trumpers are in a movie where when he said shithole countries, he was, in, in their telling of events, coming out. In other words, he was just going public with racist um, preferences and, and attitudes that, were, that he wanted to translate into actual policies. Now, if that's true that, and, and his critics are, are explaining that he said this, allegedly, uh, in front of a Democratic senator and other senators in a forum where he had to know it could and, and might probably go public. 
So the thinking is that whatever he was willing to say in front of that small group of senators, he would be equally willing to say if he were asked at a press conference. So if that movie is true, on Sunday or Monday, someone at a press conference is going to ask the President of the United States a question that is roughly like this. They're going to say, Mr. President, we need a clarification. You're asking for a merit-based immigration. If someone from Haiti or one of the so-called shithole countries, um, and I say that with love, I love my shithole countries, um, if any of them, if any citizen there met the criteria, that would be the common criteria that you would you would have for all the other countries. Could somebody from from Haiti, for example, or one of the African countries, um, immigrate to the United States under the plan that you are promoting? Now, either the president of the United States is going to say, "No, we can't take anybody from Haiti." because they all have AIDS, and uh, it's a shithole country. Now, if he says something like that, then one of the movies has been confirmed. And that would be the movie that for has been playing for, I don't know, a year and a half or two years, that says it's obvious he's a racist, and he's going to do racist stuff. <clears throat> the other movie is what his supporters have been watching, in which he does a lot of offensive things that we would all agree are offensive, but they're offensive to everybody. You know, it, he's offensive to people, you know, just, just everywhere. He, he, he speaks in a way that people take offense to, and perhaps should. Now, we'll be able to determine if their movie is an illusion by the same question that we're going to get. The press will certainly ask the president on Sunday or Monday or so. Now, if the president says, oh, let me qualify, what we're, the context was we were talking about um, a humanitarian-based policy, which is sort of what we have now. And I had been saying over and over again, I want a merit-based policy. And so I was using some colorful language to challenge the existing system. But for sure... We would want any anybody who could get a job or whatever the requirements are for being, you know, for being qualified for the merit-based immigration. If he says, yes, I absolutely want the best and the brightest from every country, including the countries that we've been talking about, I, of course, want that. That will verify the Trump supporter movie. But not all of the Trump supporters... <laughs> Because, as you know, the KKK and white nationalist type groups, you know, the serious racists, also support the president. And if you saw some of the tweets coming out of that group, they also interpreted the shithole comment the same way the left did. So, in other words, right now the racists, the people who call themselves racists, not the ones who are just accused, you know, the ones who embrace it and say that they are racists, have exactly the same opinion of what they're seeing as the anti-Trumpers, because they both see that he's, he, they see this as confirmation that he's racist. What will happen when he answers the question, <clears throat> as I'm predicting, when he says the whole point of a merit-based system is that everybody from any country can get in if they meet the qualifications, and most of them probably won't be white, because most of the world isn't white. You know, since most of the world isn't white, if we just take the 10% best from all of the places that might want to immigrate, we'll get way more brown people than white people. That's the plan I'm promoting. So what will his racist supporters say when he does something that is so clearly not what they want him to do? What are they going to do? So this is actually a, a fairly big deal because these two movies have been running in parallel and they've, been, they've both been um, fed with confirmation bias that allows both sides to say, yeah, I've been right all along. You know, here's more proof of my side. And the other side says, no, I've been right all along. Here's more proof of my side. 
and most of the time, that's how life works. We can, we can all go through life maintaining our illusions. Now, when the president got elected, and a lot of people's you know, view of reality exploded, you saw that they went a little bit crazy. <laughs> I mean, and I mean that <clears throat> in an actual clinical sense, that people were, had mental disorders because their sense of the world just got so scrambled and, and it made them crazy and afraid. So we might see something like this <clears throat> in the next two days. Because if the president does what my movie predicts he will do, which is to simply say the merit-based system, the whole point of that is to let every country in, just the good ones. You know, the, one, the good ones in this context, meaning they can get a job or they're educated, they can add to the United States, maybe there's a bonus if they can speak English as a second language, that sort of thing. Um, if that happens, what's going to happen to all the people who were sure positive, first of all, that he wouldn't get nominated, wouldn't get elected, wouldn't have a great year. They've been wrong about 25 things in a row. But this one's a little more stark. He's going to come right out and say, according to my movie, and if I'm wrong, then I have to change my opinion, right? But I'll get to find out also if my movie is just dead wrong. And then I'll have to reinterpret everything I've seen up to that point. So if he says tomorrow, you know, um, <clears throat> I didn't mean to say hit shithole countries, but I just think we should not let people in from these certain countries because they're not doing well for whatever reasons. If he says something like that, sounds pretty racist to me. I mean, I would say, well, that's confirmation that my whole movie was wrong. Because in my movie, he's not doing anything like that and doesn't plan to do anything like that. So if he comes right out when asked, because it's going to be a direct question, uh, well, we'll find out tomorrow or the next day when somebody asks him, could a doctor from Haiti immigrate to the United States under the president's own plan, for example? If he says, absolutely, we want him, then my movie is correct. <laughs> if he says, no, it doesn't matter what your qualifications are, even under a marrow system, you can't come in if you're from Haiti. If he says something like that, then the other movie is uh, is confirmed, and I will change my opinion. So people have been asking me for a while, they're saying, Scott, you, you apologist, is there anything the president can do that would change your opinion and make you believe that he's a racist? Now, usually that's such an open-ended question that it's hard to come up with like a specific example of something because there could be extenuating circumstances. So even if you agreed that if, if, if thing A happened that you would change your mind, thing A is never clean. You know, there's, there's always extenuating circumstances. But in this case, I don't know if there are any extenuating circumstances. If the president says, we're not going to let any, I don't want to let anybody in from Haiti, regardless of qualifications, if he says that, that's unambiguous, isn't it? And the belief is that he will now say this in public because he said it in front of uh, Congress people, and you know, that's a signal that he he's, has no problem saying it in a way that could get out to the public. So we get to find out. Um, yeah, a lot of people have been uh, trying to counter this by saying Obama called uh, Libya a shit show. That's not as good a point as you want it to be. Because here's the thing. A shit show and a shithole, totally different meanings. <laughs> no, it's not really the same thing. It just uses a naughty word. A shit show just means you got trouble going on. You know, a shithole, you know, means that the standard of living and their systems and their education and everything is is in question. Um, yeah, the missile alert in Hawaii, we talk, talked about that already. Yeah, and, and the whole, uh, and more generally, the whole hypocrite defense, I find a sign of weakness. 
you know, if you say, well, I'm not going to defend my guy, but your guy did something bad, that's not a defense for your guy. <laughs> it really isn't. And if I called your country a shit show, yeah, you know, a, a shithole is a much bigger uh, insult than saying something is a shit show. They do mean different things. Now, you could, you could say that the, the White House was a shit show on the first few months as they were disorganized and trying to get things together, but you wouldn't call the White House a shit hole. Uh, I can't believe that that's the discussion we're having while I fold my laundry. Everything uh, is about credibility, so... Yeah, I, I hear the logic of why it makes sense to call out the other side as hypocrites. But the reason it doesn't seem persuasive to me is that that's the part everybody already knows. You know, everybody already knows that the partisans are just spinning stuff. So you don't really need to point it out because it doesn't change anybody's mind. You know, that's the part everybody knows. <laughs> um, Somebody else is folding laundry too? Well, <clears throat> this is a rare opportunity for the simultaneous fold. If you're also folding laundry, grab a shirt. Doesn't matter what, grab your shirt. Um, I don't fold my shirts, I put them on hangers because I am that fancy. I'm so fancy, I put my shirts on hangers. Yeah. Um, you owe us an explanation how a master persuader could make such a mistake. Fair question. How is it that the President of the United States can make such a mistake as to say this um, shithole comment? So I have categorized it as a mistake. So let's put some context on it. The greatest basketball player in, in history... You could argue who that was, whether it's Michael Jordan or maybe Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry, best three-point shooter in the world. How many does he hit? About three out of ten. And we call him the best there ever was. How often should a master persuader persuade successfully? Not all the time, right? So being a master persuader is fully compatible with making lots of persuasion mistakes. Let me say that again. You can be a master persuader and not just occasionally make a mistake. You can make a lot of mistakes. That's completely compatible. Um, you know, it, as long as the, the, net, the net is good, you're, you, you still qualify. Um, now let's talk about the, the, the shit show event. <clears throat> so here's an angle on this that I don't know if I've talked about in Periscope yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that most of you haven't heard it. And I'll, I'll start with an analogy. The analogy is not meant to persuade, but to explain a new concept. Okay. Analogies are good for that. Let's say, um, you were talking to your best friend and the two of you have kids, and one of them is a teenager, and your friend says to you, oh my God, my, my, my kid is such an asshole. Now, how would you, how would you take that? <laughs> it's your best friend, you're always joking, you use this kind of language. <clears throat> it's a private conversation. <clears throat> it's a private conversation, and you know that this person loves his kid, but the kid is being kind of hard to control lately. You would say to yourself, you know, obviously it's the inappropriate language, but it wouldn't mean much of anything. So it would be horrible to say that to your kid, and it would be very horrible to say that in public. But saying it to your best friend who's not going to repeat it gives you an entirely different sense of what's going on, because there's some, some trust going on there. Now, in the context that the president said shithole countries, he was in a small, intimate group in which swearing that way has utility. 
It uh, allows him to be the, you know, the top dog because swearing sort of increases your boundaries and makes you look like you're the one in charge if you can swear and maybe the other people can't. It conveys your emotional uh, power. It sometimes simplifies things. It tells people this thing is off the table for negotiating and it's very memorable. If you use a, a good swear word, you know, like shithole is not your, uh, not your usual swear word. So it sticks in your head a little bit. So on a persuasion basis, it was very powerful, um, probably fairly common in meetings like that, government meetings at the top level. Now, how did it turn from your best friend saying, oh, God, my kid is an asshole sometimes, which means not much of anything, even though we would all agree it's inappropriate language, but it doesn't really mean anything. Once you take the same quote that, that means one thing when you're talking one-on-one -on -one or to a small group that you're trying to influence, and it's the way that you, you know, it's not unusual for talking with that particular group, as soon as you expand that to a, a public knowledge, you take the, the, small, um, the small mistake or the small offense and you turn it into an enormous one. And you see the press do this all the time. So you can take a lot of things that people will say one-on-one, -on -one, and by the, time you, uh, the, by the time you expand it up, it sounds just so much worse. Now, let me give you one from the other, the other side, okay? Uh, there's tons of news about this FBI agent Strzok and how when we saw his private messages, keyword private, to his, his girlfriend at the time, and he said some things like, uh, the president's an idiot and blah, blah, blah. Now, one has to assume that every FBI agent has an opinion at least that strong. Some of them might be pro-Trump. Pro Many of them apparently are anti-Trump. But to imagine that we, we somehow found the one FBI agent who has a strong opinion about politics, don't you think the FBI follows politics more than the average person? Cares about it, it matters to them, it's, you know, it's pretty immediate to their life. So, because we don't look at people's private conversations, we don't have sort of a, a context when we, when we see the rare case of it. So you see a rare case of somebody speaking bluntly to a loved one, you know, in this case, literally a lover, uh, it doesn't mean the same as it does when you publish it to the world. The moment you publish it to the world, you do have to demote that guy. You do have to do, um, you know, you have to look into it. You've got to research it. You've got to ask a lot of questions. So you have to do all the things you have to do once it's public. But the truth is, it's a whole organization and this would be true of just every large organization, of people who think and talk privately exactly like Strzok did. Now, the, the quote about we need an insurance policy, I'm going to stay open-minded on that. Because if you say to yourself, I can't imagine anything that could be, except he's saying that we got to take out the president with this insurance policy. I'm with you. Because I can't, immediately come up with a scenario where that would mean anything else. But I'm also aware of how many times I've been surprised in situations where just because I couldn't imagine there was some other explanation had no bearing on whether or not there was another explanation. So I would say you really need to wait to see what Strzok and his girlfriend say about those specific messages that are bothersome. You have every right to be worried. <clears throat> red flag, red flag. You know, all, all the concern that people are putting into this, completely warranted. Largely because they're public, and so now we have to be concerned. But if you think that your certainty about what that message means is related to what that message means, I would suggest that those are just different phenomena. That message could mean other things. And when, when you hear their explanation of it, it could flip us immediately to say, oh, yeah, I had not, had not occurred to me, but that, it, that could 
explain what that message means. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying that it's dangerous business to imagine we can interpret that, and there's only one interpretation. All right. Uh, what would be an example, someone says, of how differently you can interpret it? Well, the insurance policy could refer to um, their own careers. So they might say to themselves, uh oh, um, if, and, and again, I'm only speculating, I'm not saying this is what they meant. I'll just give you an example. Let's say they had an insurance policy, meaning that the, some of the people in the FBI knew that they wouldn't want to stay there if Trump were president. And it could be that some top members of the FBI were talking privately about maybe a business thing that they could do together if they decide to move on or the president cleans house at the top. Now, would you refer to that as your insurance policy? In other words, your plan B? Maybe. Now, I'm not suggesting that's what it meant, but if you couldn't imagine any other interpretation of it, don't confuse that with there's no other interpretation of it. Those are different things. <laughs> um, he was talking about saving the country. <clears throat> um, I'd have to see if all those statements were actually as related as you think. So I understand what you're saying, that the context of one of the comments was about the fate of the country. But you can imagine how a casual conversation with someone who knows who knows what you're talking about, you leave out context, and you you can put two thoughts in the same paragraph because the person reading it knows what you mean, that sort of thing. So if you're asking me, can I give you a convincing other explanation for what struck meant, I would say no. But that's just not related to whether or not there is another explanation that it, that would be satisfying. So for those coming in late, um, I'm heading to Hawaii tomorrow, and I'm not happy that, <laughs> that everybody over there is going to be tense and the weather is going to be terrible. So my first vacation in a year, I'm going to the missile, the missile zone, uh, that shithole Hawaii with the bad weather. Apparently it'll be bad weather the whole week that we're there. Um, Flu season, yeah, wouldn't that be great? Can I tell you about the indoor bushes in my last periscope? Yes, I have some fake um, fake bushes that I have in my man cave garage, uh, and it's just for a privacy screen, because if, if one of those doors is open, the neighbor across the street can be staring at me in my man cave. That's all. So I did uh, Michael Smirkanish's show on CNN early this morning. Did any of you see me on CNN today? I had to wake up early while you were sleeping. Michael Smirkanish and I were, were up working. Nobody saw it? <laughs> uh, I probably will, will periscope from Hawaii, yes. Um, I was on Sprinkanish. Yeah, Sprinkanish has, it's a special two-hour show, so you may have watched the wrong hour. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll periscope on vacation. All right, so somebody said I did well on that. That's good. Thank you. Um, yeah, did you notice, <clears throat> did you notice that Michael... Uh, let me talk, and for those of you who saw it, <clears throat> were you surprised that he didn't push back on anything I said? Was anybody surprised about that? Because what I said was pretty much, I wouldn't say it was a contradiction, but it was a different way of looking at the same, same data he was looking at and drawing a completely different conclusion. Um, but he let me, he let me completely explain 
my point of view on it, and I, I thought it was very generous in terms of uh, you know letting me have a, a good time for explanation. Um, when when I have a link, I'll I'll tweet that around. Usually the usually there's a follow up link that I'll I'll see at some point. <laughs> um, I think you can watch it on the link when I get it. Yeah, you know, uh, it's got to be hard for CNN to book guests. You know, in the same way it's hard for Fox News to book, um, you know, the the best and most credible people on the left. Because people don't like to necessarily appear on a show. So a lot of, many of you noticed that I appeared on InfoWars uh, both yesterday and then last week, I think. And uh, I, always, I always get a lot of flack for appearing on InfoWars because, you know, there are plenty of critics who dislike them for one reason or another. And I don't defend, I don't defend them for anything. You know, they can defend themselves. But my brand is that I can talk to anybody. So think about how, think about how useful that is. There are a lot of people who are saying, my God, how can you associate with you know, this show or this person or whatever, to which I say, I can totally associate with them. I can have a conversation with anybody I want. I can fully listen to their point of view, and when I disagree, I can disagree with it. I live in a free country. I can totally talk to InfoWars. And I have to admit, the fact that people get mad when I appear there, it does make me want to do it more. It, it doesn't work the other way. Because when people tell me that I can't talk with someone, and, and by the way, I don't subscribe to their views, I subscribe to my own views. Yeah, so I get the same, same grief if, you know, when I was talking to uh, a leader from um, Black Lives Matter, I got all kinds of grief from Trump supporters saying, why can you talk to somebody from that organization that has espoused bad things like killing cops? To which I say, an organization is not a person, and I was talking to a person, and they don't all share these radical beliefs, and if you're not willing to talk to somebody because they've got some label or they're wearing a t-shirt or something, how the hell are you ever going to, you know, how are you ever going to figure out what they're saying? How can you check your own work unless you talk to somebody who's got a completely different view? So, my brand is I'll talk to anybody. Kim Jong-un, um, Noam Chomsky, Alex Jones, bring them on. That's my brand. Um, <laughs> All right. Why don't you fly private to Hawaii? Flying private is a different level of rich. Um, I would love to be private airplane rich, but yeah, that, that's a gigantic expense. You know, flying private is you know sort of thirty thousand dollars every time you you book your plane. Even millionaires fold their pants one leg at a time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a waste of fuel, and it doesn't make me any happier. Uh, I actually like flying private. I mean, I'm I'm usually flying in a you know a good class of flight, so it's not painful. All right, I'm going to sign off now. We've done enough for now. Uh, yeah, it probably is safer to fly commercial. Somebody just said. <laughs>